All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our December of 2022 Global One Health Initiative webinar supported by the NIH Fulgurdi International Center. Our topic for today is One Health Leadership, and we will be hearing from two leaders paving the way in One Health, Dr. Lonnie King and Dr. Wanison Gabreas. And I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Barian. Thank you so much, Dr. Binkley, and thank you all so much for joining us today for our Global One Health Initiative webinar series. I am Amanda Berrien, Director of our Outreach and Engagement for Go High, and today, as Dr. Binkley mentioned, our final webinar of 2022, our focus will be on One Health leadership. Leadership is one of the core One Health competency domains because at the core of the One Health approach is collaboration and connection of diverse sectors and disciplines in order to effectively bring people and groups together and work towards shared goals requires leaders who are both visionary and strategic and who can foster these working environments that are really built on mutual respect, trust, and partnership. So we are very fortunate to be joined today by two preeminent One Health leaders, really pioneers, who will be sharing their insights on effective leadership drawing from their extensive experiences, and I'll elaborate more on those experiences for you. Let me start by providing an introduction of our speakers. First, we will hear today from Dr. Lonnie King. Dr. King has served as Dean for three colleges over 17 years, most recently serving as the Interim Dean of the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences at The Ohio State University. He was also Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine at OSU from 20, um, 2009 to 2015. At Ohio State, Dr. King served as the Executive Dean for the seven health science colleges at the university. Before becoming Dean at OSU, he was the first director of the National Center for Zoonotic, Vector-Borne, and Enteric Diseases at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC. Dr. King led the center's activities for surveillance, diagnostics, disease investigations, epidemiology, research, public education, policy development, disease prevention, and public health concerns. Before serving as director, he was the first chief of the agency's Office of Strategy and Innovation. Dr. King also served as the country's chief veterinary officer, where he worked extensively in global trade and closely with the World Organization for Animal Health, now known as WOA. He also served as the deputy administrator for veterinary services of the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, where he led national efforts in disease eradication, imports and exports, diagnostic labs, animal welfare. As a native of Worcester, Ohio, Dr. King received his bachelor's and DVM degrees from the Ohio State University. He earned his Master of Science in Epidemiology from the University of Minnesota and received an honorary degree from Tufts University for his career accomplishments um, in 2022. Dr. King is also a board certified member of the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine and has completed the Senior Executive Fellowship Program at Harvard University. He was elected as a member of the National Academy of Medicine of the National Academies of Science in 2004 and served as vice chair of the National Academy of Medicine's Forum on Microbial Threats to Health. Dr. King has been awarded both the Global One Health Award by the World Small Animal Veterinary Medical Association and the OIE Meritorious Award for his distinguished global career in animal and public health. Welcome, Dr. King. It is an honor and a privilege to have you today. Our other speaker is our very own Dr. Juana Singabreas, who's the executive director of the Global One Health Initiative at The Ohio State University, president of the Global One Health LLC based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and the Hazel C. Youngberg Distinguished Professor in Molecular Epidemiology. Dr. Gabreas recently re completed a leadership fellow uh, fellowship with the American Council on Education and was elected to the National Academy of Medicine. He is known for spearheading the novel interdisciplinary global one health academic program at the Ohio State University, bringing together diverse disciplines across the health sciences, agriculture, environment, and natural resources, business, engineering, education, and social science. As president of the Global One Health LLC, he has been able to lead numerous high-impact research and training projects, including those related to public health social impact on COVID-19, the Global Health Security Agenda, research training in food, water, and vector-borne disease capacity in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Tanzania, and a global innovation initiative in Brazil and Mexico. 
These projects address priority global issues using integrated research, training, and outreach grassroots approach. As a principal investigator, Dr. Gabrias has been sponsored by the National Institute of Health, Fogarty International Center, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, U.S. State Department, Global Innovation Initiative, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with total financial grant activities surpassing $52 million. As a molecular epidemiologist and scholar, Dr. Gabrias is world-renowned for his work addressing antimicrobial resistance. His scholarly achievements include more than 160 peer-reviewed manuscripts, and he's also mentored and co-advised more than 145 local and international students and scholars. Some of his current services include uh, serving as a member of the advisory board of the NIH Fogarty International Center, vice chair of executive committee for the National Academy of International Education, external advisory board chair of the USAID One Health Workforce Next Generation, a member of the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Committee on Prevention of Future Pandemics and Zoonotic Spillover, and was also recently elected to serve on the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Forum on Microbial Threats for a three-year appointment. Dr. Cabreas has received national and international recognition, including the NIH Gold Medallion Award, the North Carolina State University Distinguished Alumni Award, Universitas 21 International Award, and the APLU Michael P. Malone International Leadership Award. So you can see we have two uh, experts who really are the uh, preeminent um, the individuals to speak on this concept of One Health leadership. So a warm welcome to both of our esteemed speakers today. Um, the format for our webinar today will include presentations by both Dr. King and Dr. Gabreas followed by a Q&A featuring questions from you all, our audience. So as a reminder, if you have questions for our speakers, please enter them into the Q&A box and we will address them as many as we can in our allotted time at the end of the presentations. So without further delay, let's um, hear from our first speaker today, who is Dr. King. Dr. King, take it away. Great. Dr. Barron, thank you very much. We appreciate that. Uh... A warm introduction, all too long, I'm afraid, but thank you very much. Good morning to everybody, um, and good afternoon, and perhaps good evening to others. It's a pleasure for me to participate in uh, today's webinar on One Health Leadership, and I want to add my thanks to the whole Go High team, and a special thanks to Dr. Finkley and, and Dr. Berrien for uh, putting on these webinars. So, and, and the time I have allotted, and, and I'm sure Dr. Uh, Gabreas will also talk in some of these areas. Here's some things we want to talk about uh, this morning. Why has One Health leadership increased in importance? Secondly, how have our recent outbreaks and pandemics changed our thinking on leadership and how these wicked problems are changing the role of leaders and the definition of leadership? What is the new leadership paradigm? What's it look like? Why does it work better in today's complex world? And then what are some critical lessons that we've learned from recent outbreaks over the last uh, two decades and have redefined leadership and have really set up a, uh, a new paradigm going into the future? And what are the essential leadership skills that are needed to be an effective One Health leader? Uh, and how can you learn and acquire these? So that's gonna be a lot uh, for 30 minutes, but we'll touch on those as we uh, move ahead. Next slide. So whether you're, a senior leader or, or getting started in your career or mid-career, or especially if you're a, a student in professional graduate school, um, we, we all have a very unprecedented future. Today's world is rapidly changing. It's dynamic. Uh, and I believe it's fundamentally going to change how you work, why you work, where you will work, with whom you will work, and what you'll work on. It's that fundamental change into our future that demands that you have different skills and is changing the whole idea of about leadership. You need to thrive and excel in what's called a VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. And to do this, you need to gain new skills. And implicit in this changing skill set is the growing importance of leadership, which will in part determine the level of your future success and I thank you, professional satisfaction going ahead. Next. Next, next slide, please. So uh, as we wake up this morning, we live in an extraordinary world. For those of you that are in public health, global health, One Health, um, 
uh, it, it's uh, it's a world that's crowded. It's warming. It's interconnected. It's rapidly changing. It's globally oriented. It's dynamic. Uh, uh, our world is rooted in an eroding environment with uh, unprecedented losses of biodiversity and ecosystems. A world in which we're going to see more pandemics into the future and of greater consequence. So we can say that. The main challenge of the 21st century is that we face the reality that humanity shares a common fate on a crowded planet. And we need to change our thinking and how to address this and leadership is front and center. Next, next slide. So there's a term called wicked problems and it comes out of the business community. And I like it because it really does this screen describe these kind of dilemmas and and complex, difficult global problems that we face. So wicked problems are complex. They are, they're tangled together with a lot of factors. We've not seen them before. They are not well-defined, so they're enigmatic. And importantly, the solutions are not yes or no. There's not a technical solution to answer these questions or problems. There are many choices, uh, and it is a, a very complex group of choices. Wicked problems will generate unexpected consequences. Uh, and most importantly, for all of us to remember that unique and past experiences may not be helpful. So the idea of how we were thinking in the past and managing programs and leading programs are really changing pretty dramatically. These problems that are wicked, if you think about them, no one's really in charge. You've got people in charge of leading certain segments but they've now not come together to say one group or one person's in charge and how do you actually lead in, uh, when no one's in charge. Often it's a symptom of other issues and problems. So uh, obviously with COVID, a new symptom and new problems are mental and emotional health that uh, now is a consequence that have come forward. And these problems originate from society and they also need to be resolved by society. And that changes uh, how we think about leadership moving ahead. Next. So one of our uh, wicked difficult problems are emerging infectious diseases. Uh, and this is described as the convergence model or the perfect microbial storm, where most of the factors uh, that are creating this environment are anthropogenic. They are human induced and human caused. So they're physical and environmental factors ecological changes and factors of which humans have uh, mainly caused these, social, political, and economic factors, and then opportunities for microbes uh, to adapt to change because we've given them a comparative advantage today. These circulate around in, in, in a, a, a traditional kind of hurricane or storm in which the center now uh, we find emerging diseases in animals and plants and wildlife and people that we've not seen before. Next slide. So this is obviously not a US problem or an Ethiopia problem or any limit to any single disease. This is a global issue. And this little map that's embedded here just looks at emerging diseases around the world over the last two or three decades. And you can see that they are everywhere. And because of that, we know now a threat anywhere in the world is now a threat everywhere. You're no longer, we are no longer isolated. These microbes can move around the world faster than their incubation period and we're moving faster uh, in a more complex interconnected world. Next. So to address this uh, wicked problems of emerging infections, especially emerging zoonotic diseases, you know, we're using the concept and approach of, <clears throat> excuse me, one health. CDC defines that as a concept that addresses complex challenges to promote the health and well being of all species and the environment through the integration of relevant sciences at the, systems at, at the systems level. So when we think about One Health, it's, um, it's uh, to handle wicked problems, it's trans multidisciplinary, it's holistic, it's integrated very different kinds of thinking and operating uh, in, this, uh, in this world. Next. So where are we today? So as we both wake, all wake up this morning or a little bit earlier, 
you know, for me, warning lights are blinking red all over. Um, we have threats uh, of which we're not doing too much about. And our world, I think, will be a continuation of emerging infections and um, outbreaks of high consequence because we aren't really changing and moving forward in important ways. The drivers and factors that have created this perfect microbial storm are not only in place, but they are accelerating. They are intensified, they're magnified. And now we add to this global change and the huge impact that's going to have on infectious diseases and in health in general, not just infectious diseases. <laughs> Outbreaks will be more frequent and consequential. Wicked problems are increasing where no one continues to be in charge, so they become more difficult to control. We're still very poorly prepared globally for the next outbreak. And unfortunately, we haven't learned a lot of lessons from the past. And failure to mitigate these problems, especially in disease problems, could prevent the achievement of key United Nations development goals. So that's what's at risk if we don't do, um, if we don't do much better. So poverty, children's health, economic development, clean water, environment are all part of the US, uh, United Nations development goals. And those cannot be achieved if we're going to continue to have outbreaks and pandemics worldwide. We need to gain more support uh, and more integration with our agriculture around the world. They have new possibilities, but they certainly are vulnerable. And I think as we wake up today, there are three key threats in the global health zoonotic disease world. And that's a new emerging infectious disease. And we know that the likelihood of that originating in animal populations or from animal products is 75 to 80%. We could have a global antimicrobial resistant bacteria infection that becomes a pandemic. And we're really concerned about food insecurity. So these would be emerging infectious diseases, uh, transboundary diseases in animal populations, not necessarily zoonotic, but it could certainly greatly curtail um, food needs around the world. Next. So I just kind of look back over the last couple of decades and what we did with SARS, with Ebola, monkeypox, uh, dengue, uh, Q fever in the Netherlands, and kind of reviewed those to find out, you know, kind of what are the critical lessons that we should have learned and should have been more aggressive in addressing these. So one is that the threat is global. The idea is that we have kind of walls around our countries or regions um, is nonsensical. Uh, a threat anywhere is a threat everywhere. There's a great book I like a lot. It's called Predictable Surprises. So as I look over these at outbreaks the last two to three decades, right, it seems every time we have one, we kind of recreate the solutions. It's like we've never seen one before. So uh, we shouldn't be surprised because these are predictable events moving ahead. The greatest threats uh, will likely come from colleagues in, in lower and middle uh, income countries where they um, unfortunately don't have the resources and perhaps the, the permanent workforce to address some of these. And that's really going to be key to our future and getting prepared for addressing these uh, problems. And then I think changing the narrative. <clears throat> the One Health issues are not just part of public health or animal health or human health. The narrative now changes. And the narrative is a capacity to justify and legitimize a cause and influence change. And that narrative goes from kind of a medical problem, if you will, to a, a global security issue. So you, you can't have a condition like COVID that may be costing $20 trillion and impact the world over the last three years, uh, well beyond medicine, <clears throat> without changing the narrative. And thinking of these problems as national and global security issues. So that means that they're address, addressed differently than just being a medical problem. Unfortunately, poverty and inequity have emerged as growing consequences of these global problems. So poverty is both a cause and result of diseases. 
And we see that uh, worldwide. It just accentuates uh, the problems in poverty, making it more and more difficult for other colleagues in the world uh, to, to catch up. There's a mismatch between organizations and what we have today in today's thinking. And the mismatch is most organizations are built around hierarchical relationships. Um, they are focused on their singular intent. And yet we need horizontal thinking, collaboration across many different communities, and a leadership not of a single organization, but a distributive leadership model. And all this needs to change as we go forward. We need to shift our thinking and our strategies upstream, closer to the origin of the problems, and spend more money and more resources toward prevention. So um, the World Economic Forum said if we would have spent 2% of what it cost in the last 10, 10 years of an outbreak, that would be all it would take to prevent um, an outbreak into the future and the huge economic consequences. The cost of failure, I don't think we thought it through, but the difficulties in the United Nations uh, developmental goals are all going to be impacted from these problems if we don't get on top of them. Investments need to change from a medical issue and looking at human disease to shift to prevention and preparedness. Uh, and there is that taking place right now. And I think you will see post-COVID, if we have a, a, a post-COVID, uh, we'll actually be lots of reports and after action reports that will, I believe, um, push forward changes and shifting our money into prevention and preparedness as opposed to just responding constantly to problems. Our outbreaks are as much social as they are biomedical. And I think when Dr. Wanderson Gabreas talks about kind of the global events, you know, that's what we see. There are a lot of social aspects of these problems. They're just not a medical issue. And leadership uh, has to take that into consideration. Next. And this is just, uh, you know, a, a, a reminder, a reminder that half of the world's population probably lives on less than $10 a day. So we just hit 8 billion people on the face of the earth. And to think that um, more than half of our colleagues are in what we would call low, low and middle income countries makes it really difficult for them to catch up, to have the resources available to address these problems. And we need to address this uh, huge uh, economic uh, discrepancy if we're going to make any progress moving forward. Next. So I think we can agree that uh, these are wicked problems. They're difficult. They're part of the world as we wake up today. Um, so what are we going to do about this? Next. So I turn to the topic today, and that's leadership. So for me, leadership is simple the definition is it's the process of influencing others to help achieve a common goal. And leaders show the way, influence the behavior and actions of others. Now, that's more difficult because of, so, of these problems being embedded in society where communities themselves are very different. And I think people used to think that influencing was a bad word. Well, not hardly. That is what we actually need to do to influence people's changes of behavior and their thinking moving forward. It's the key feature of leadership. So to become an effective leader, and I hope everybody listening to today is uh, in that mode. Excuse me, no previous experience is required. Okay? You don't have to be in a certain position. You don't have to have certain jobs in the past to do this. You can do it from where you are and, and it, and leadership is not a rare skill at all. Nothing is further from the truth. Everyone, everyone has leadership potential. And I think it's been proven, certainly in the business and the medical communities consistently, that people overvalue what they are not and undervalue what they are and who they are. So, so this is more of a positive outlook on who you are and what you can do. And I think assuming the responsibility of the leader is about finding your unique gifts 
we all have these unique gifts that we need to release and move forward. And that is part of the uh, skills and the skill sets and leadership ahead. And it's really, I think, wonderful as you're thinking about positions and jobs and where you are <clears throat> in our world today. Uh, we have one thing to look forward to, and that's measuring our service and magnitude of improving lives. Not what our position says it is or how much money we make, measuring service and the magnitude of improving lives. So never has there been a time, I think, in the history of the world where leadership and making these changes is more important. And I think people listening today and in the One Health community uh, have that to look forward to. Next. So the last two decades have really changed the definition of leadership. We used to think of uh, leadership as, uh, as, as heroes, kind of riding in on a white horse, uh, a man or a woman that's making these huge changes and, um, and they're heroes. And I can tell you that superheroes are, are part of the movies. They aren't part of reality anymore. So it's a shift from leaders as heroes, which I think is it was in the past, I don't know if it ever were, to leaders as facilitators. If these are wicked problems, and as a leader, you're facilitating change behavior, how people think, and pulling people together in teams. So there's an important shift from this individual authoritative leader to a group of leaders, a constellation of complementary people leading and what we would term leadership then as an ecology. Ecology of teams where members are interchangeable between leaders and followers, and you move in and out of leadership roles. You don't have to be a CEO or the director or have a title to be an effective leader. And that's changing fairly dramatically. Next. The key opportunity, and I think for all of us and for all of us listening today, is the opportunity for continuous learning and continuous improvement. Leaders regard every false step or mistake as a learning opportunity, not the end of the world. Leaders are first and foremost learners. They learn from their mistakes as well as their successes. And I think this is common where people are, are concerned that they're gonna make a misstep or make a mistake. <clears throat> and leadership is about practice. And when we practice, we're going to do some things right and some things wrong. If they do something wrong, we learn from that and get better as we move ahead. Leadership is a learned skill. It's not inherited. And it's a process that develops daily over a whole lifetime. It's not a destination, but it's a lifelong journey that you commit to. Next. I think it's really important to think about this kind of concept. And that's the idea that um, that one of the key lessons learned is that there's two faces of leadership. And that's the ability to move in and out of positions as being a follower and being leader. So, so to be able to, these are interchangeable positions. And circumstances may define when you step into a leadership role and when you step back. Uh, and our circumstances going into the future is that more and more opportunities are gonna be for leaders uh, but your jobs may be leading and following at, at, you know, at different times. And leaders uh, and followers circulate around a purpose, not each other. So it's the cause that's important, um, not followers just um, looking at a, at a single leader and following them. Uh, that's, uh, I think that's the wrong steps today. Followers and leaders are interchangeable. They move around a single purpose. So effective leaders are embedded throughout organizations. They aren't the, the titular head of the pyramid that has a certain title. They are leaders in all positions at all levels of organizations. Uh, and you lead from where you are uh, and what you're doing. So it's finding your voice uh, and it's taking advantage of your jobs today you don't have to wait till you're quote, designated with a title. Next. So, so, so this is what we've learned, I think, just from the, the, uh, the, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa that I followed pretty, pretty closely. That we had the wrong leadership model. 
It was hierarchical, and now we need to change to distributive. So effective leadership is distributed. It's throughout the society. It's not a single head like in the World Health Organization that supplies leadership. We need to understand situation awareness. So what is happening on the ground where we need to make decisions, not a world away, telling people what to do. We have to involve stakeholders and communities more and more. If that's where the problems originate, that's where they're gonna be solved. And unless leaders take on leaders, stakeholders and communities as part of the solutions, they won't get changed. We're looking at global disruptions and a whole different risk framework as we think about moving ahead and redesigning international organizations such as the World Health. A wonderful organization, very committed, great um, experts. Uh, they need to continue, but we need to rethink and redesign what they do. They no longer are the world's workforce. They are facilitating building capacity in, 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 around the world and giving um, technical support. So we have to reimagine leadership. It's not about heroic models. It's about collaboration. It's about networking. And we need to train leaders in this complex world. So you learn as you do, merging leadership and development actions and that culture of resilience is so important. Next. So one of the models that I like, and you can look the, up online, you can actually take courses in this, is the concept of meta-leadership. It actually came out of a group of Harvard and it was built on crises where we've uh, had lessons from these crises, especially um, it was the oil uh, <clears throat> spill in the Gulf and it was also 9-11 where they studied very carefully. And they said meta-leadership has um, really five parts. The first is the person yourself, your skill set, your commitment to be a leader. Secondly, to understand situation awareness. What is happening around you? That will indicate when you're a leader, when you're a follower, um, and how to take action. It's important to be able to lead across, spatially connecting across your jurisdictions where you don't have authority. If a wicked problem is the case where no one's in charge, and nobody's going to tell you how to lead or what to lead. So it's that ability to move across the organizations, across countries, across universities, across boundaries, where you don't have authority, but you can still take advantage of leadership roles. You still leading within silos is really probably more of a, being able to manage well. And it's understanding the culture. So there's nothing wrong about that. It just is part of understanding meta leadership, the ability to lead up. Something that I've seen over my years is difficult for people to do. They get so caught up in, <clears throat> in their own roles that they forget that leading up is a very important part of leadership and part of, uh, of influence. And then gaining the personal skills and continuous learning to have this core identity as we move ahead. And, and then the last one is really understanding culture. And certainly in global health, and global public health, understanding the different cultures, the different values that people have and communities are critical in establishing leadership roles and in actions going forward. Next. So I like the George Bernard Shaw uh, quote, life is not about finding yourself. Life is about creating yourself. And I think that's so important. So it's not just about kind of a journey looking for yourself and what you're going to do. It's very intentional. It's about creating yourself and taking responsibility to do that. Next. So how do we do that? Well, I think there's five steps. First, um, to find who you, what, what is it that you want to become? And this can change over a person's career, but say over the next five years to 10 years. What is it that you want to become and want to do? So that's your kind of ideal self. So with that in mind, then step back and say, well, <clears throat> who am I today? It's that self-assessment. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? And then thirdly, once you identify the gap between where you are today and what you want to become, that becomes your learning agenda. How can I fill these gaps to build on my strengths? 
<clears throat> so with that agenda, then you want to take action. And that action is experimenting, excuse me, practicing, taking on new roles, new responsibilities, so that you can gain the, the, the critical competencies to fill that gap. And then to make sure you have a supporting and trusting relationships to make change possible. You have to have people around you to coach, to mentor, to support, to share ideas. And we find out that good leaders, this is a critical piece of what they have. And then I, I believe becoming an effective leader will absolutely change the tra trajectory of your career and expand your life's work. So that's, I think, an important enough fact for you to take these steps moving forward. Next. So Thad Allen was a, uh, and is a uh, effective leader that came out of uh, the Navy. He managed uh, Hurricane Cortina and Deepwater Horizon problems. And I've heard him talk. And when he talks about what leadership is, he says leadership to him is the ability to reconcile opportunity with competency. So think about that. Reconcile opportunity with competency. So what are the opportunities? Well, we just spent 15 minutes to start this talk to tell you of this changing world. The opportunities are almost unlimited in global, animal, and human, and one, one health moving forward. So you have to think about acquiring the competencies and the skills necessary to match those opportunities. And if you become good at that, you will then become a strategic and an effective leader. So remember this reconciliation. Opportunities abound. Your competencies then need to be built to match those opportunities so you're really good at it. Next. So we'll kind of end on, well, what are the competencies that, that you need? So, so what is it you need to learn? Uh, what are those abilities? So uh, Dr. Berry had missed, uh, mentioned a few of them when she talked about uh, Go High today, but it, leadership is first and foremost. Good at communications, working across boundaries, ability to systems think, to engage stakeholders, understanding situation awareness, situation analysis, being interpersonally competent. And I can tell you over my years of experience that <clears throat> um, interpersonal in intelligence quotient or co is more important than, than being smart. Building relationships said to be the key, most important single skill of the next decade, building relationships, understanding health determinants in this complex events that uh, determine health, certainly beyond infectious diseases, building and managing multi-transdisciplinary teams, understanding risk analysis, our environment and ecosystems and how they impact health and how their changes can then be a key strategy of One Health. Fostering collaboration, culturally and socially aware, and managing stress and conflict, not only with and among others, but within yourself. Next. So over the last three years uh, in this VUCA world, new leadership skills have emerged. And the group out of California are looking uh, at the future said your skill set will change about 35% in five years. So what you're good at today may change five years from now, and you have to have a whole new skill set. So this is part of the learning process. Leading remote teams, building trust to lead during misinformation. And that is a lesson that we're learning now. Building and working in diverse teams, respecting diversity, equality, and inclusion. Being multi-fluent, socially, intellectually, and technically understand all the, all the noise going on in our systems and to be able to take pre, uh, critical signals from that. Influency, the key part of the definition of leadership, being persuasive in multiple contexts and media, thinking outside your building. If you can't find like-minded and committed people within your organization, go outside and find that. I'm really interested in what Ohio State's done. They now have a group of wicked scientists <laughs> that have pulled together uh, across the university and self-care uh, and resilience. Next. So how are you going to learn these things? So we know 
what your strategy is in terms of where you are, what you need to become, and how do you fill that gap? We know what the critical skills are necessary as you move forward. Then how are you going to do this? Well, one is to be self-aware and have self-care. If you don't take care of yourself emotionally and physically, you can't do this. Begin from where you are today. You don't have to wait until you're in a certain position. You can make that commitment right now that you have a professional identity. And that professional identity is your core ethical thinking and your value system that never changes. It's really important that you have that. That you learn from each other. You have coaches, you have mentors. And not only do you have people encouraging, you have people telling you the truth in terms of where you are and what you need to do. It's important for all of us. You're interpersonally competent. You're patient and tolerant of the perfections, not only of others, but of your own imperfections. We can study this, especially by looking at other leaders. You can take on assignments that are shadow assignments by working with other leaders. You can volunteer for stretch projects that you think are beyond your capability that really aren't. Secondments are opportunities for organizations to exchange people in leadership roles. Interpersonal education, and most importantly, is the practice, practice, and practice. Leadership is a learned skill that takes place over a lifetime. Next. So I, I end with this uh, note from uh, Abigail Adams, who uh, about 250 years ago said, Nate, great necessities call forth great leaders. And 250 years later, that's still true. The necessities have changed. Our need for leadership haven't. So this resonates over two and a half centuries. So thank you very much. And uh, let's listen to what Dr. Gabreas has to say. Great, thank you so much, Lonnie. Great, lots of wonderful leadership wisdom. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Let's see, point. Can you see my presentation, Amanda? Give me somebody thumbs up. Uh, your presentation is in presenter mode from what we can see. Is that correct? Is that correct, Miss? Um, no. No, um, no. Swap display, let me yeah. see. What about now? Perfect. Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much for the invite and generous introduction, Dr. Berian, uh, Dr. Binkley. Thank you, Dr. King. Great leadership wisdom again. Um, so in the next 20 or so minutes, I'll try to make my presentation a bit shorter, but I will complement with what uh, Lani shared in terms of this wonderful wisdom of leadership and complex issues that we are all facing globally, right? So the VUCA, volatile, uncertain, uh, complex, and ambiguous. Really, one else fits clearly into that dimension. And we all live constantly in a VUCA world. So how do you practically on the ground show one as a leadership? And I really appreciate what Lonnie said. And our team at Goha have been saying all along is we all have leadership potential. Anybody at there, it doesn't matter what, what hierarchy or level you are, but definitely you can make influence others to make impactful contributions, which is great part of uh, leadership. And thank you all the audience and thank you everyone on the field doing great work on a day-to-day -day basis to make one health a reality. And particular thanks to our own GoHai team in Ohio as well as uh, Ethiopia. So uh, what I will do is, you know, as Lonnie said, leadership is about influencing others to make into a collective goal, right? So one else is a very complex issue, uh, one of the wicked problems, but how did we do it in, and or how are we doing it at Ohio State Global One else initiative it was our partners across the world. So I will I will try to interject as I present about Go, I try to interject about four aspects. One is how do you really develop a collective, a shared vision that has a clear uh, impact uh, on the global community while we live in a very siloed world, right? Uh, secondly, how do you bring in multidisciplinary talents, highly needed? You know, multidisciplinary talent is critical for one else, any complex issue. So how do we do that? So I would try to give you some examples. 
The third is how do we communicate empathically to develop that trust as you work between Ohio and other states or US and developing region between US and Ethiopia or Mexico, Brazil, Kenya and others. How do you effectively communicate the one as issues as well as you know, to listen to each other, build a trust when you have that utmost trust you can make then impactful, efficient contribution to the planet. The fourth and last one is then resources are critical. As Lonnie said, you know, the small fraction of the investment in the world that could have really prevented large catastrophic epidemics and pandemics. But how do we mobilize resources to make that effective contribution? So I'll try to show you a few as I walk through. So one is, as you all the audience by now know very well, you know, the interdependence of human health, animal health, plant health, and environment that understand this holistic approach towards really addressing this complex issue. So I'm not going to go into the details of the definition, but this diagram sh shows you a very clear interface of one else and how it's important, not just impacting human health and animal health, but collectively to the sustainability of uh, our planet. Of course, as we are into this COVID-19 pandemic, we are at a critical inflection point in this world, right? So if you take this inflection point when COVID hit back late in 2019 or beginning of 2020, uh, one else has been recognized more and more as a very important and crucial approach to the planet. Now it is really time to show one as leadership across the world. It's not about just Dr. King or Ohio State Global One or others, but all of us around the world need to have uh, the instill that trust to really build and make impactful contributions. So one as leadership is much more critical uh, than ever before. So how are we doing it? You know, one of the many, many examples at Ohio State is, you know, uh, even though uh, our Global Honors Initiative is about 11, 12 years old, about five years ago, we developed a very clear shared vision. Uh, that vision is building healthy and enduring global community. How do we effectualize that healthy and enduring, not just healthy, but improving livelihoods as at that interface of human, animal, plant, and environment health aspects. We believe that as a university, our niche is building capacity, capable professional and institutional systems. Of course, different organizations, regulatory organizations may have their own ways of impacting one health, impacting the world through one health or research institutes and others. As a university-based organization, we believe the three core areas enable us building capable professionals and institutional systems to have healthy and enduring global community. Coming up with this vision and the core strategy goals is very difficult, right? Because you have to bring in large number of multidisciplinary team, I will show you uh, shortly. But the three core goals we thought is we need to embed capacity building towards applied impactful research and implementation is a grassroots implementation. Secondly, we must have a training and education capacity. That's critical, not just for where we are working, let's say Ethiopia or other countries, but also for our own Ohio State students, faculty and the staff. And then the third is outreach. How do we share knowledge, exchange information and impact communities as well as scientists? So outreach and extension capacity. So with those three anchors, we believe that we will achieve that vision that will have critical impact on the planet. Quickly to show you this integrated type of a strategy and capacity building, we have a training education capacity portfolio that has a multidisciplinary talent and bringing in the various priorities. You know, we have a shorter term like summer institute, I'll show you one slide, you know, curriculum tuning in a moderate term to really transfer skills to partners because this is capacity building. We do not just want to train people for another country forever. We are the ones who know better. That's not our mentality. We need to build equal partnership. We need to build needs assessment in a given ecosystem in a setting that we work in based on the priorities of the country. We must then transfer knowledge that we have and then learn from each other as well. 
then build long-term critical mass of scientists at a PhD or postdoctoral level. That will allow workforce capacity building. The second portfolio of our strategic goal is, goal is applied research and implementation capacity in diverse priority areas, depending on the country, the region, based on our mutual interest, we work on various complex one health issues. Food safety, zoonotic disease are among two primarily very well-known one health issues, antimicrobial resistance, but also infectious and let's say oncovirus-based cancer issues towards any healthy and enduring global community, we collectively embrace it under the global one health. And that could be the other one. You know, through that, doing grassroots impactful uh, implement, uh, applied research, we plan, you know, we have been building capacity in terms of transboundary field surveillance or risk ranking and any capabilities that are needed at our project sites. We also develop you know, interfacing cross cutting issues like molecular diagnostics, genomics, various omics, clinical trial capacity that would allow us also building laboratory capacity and hospital-based capacity strengths. So when we do that, you know, interfacing with the training, we don't just do training capacity, but research training. And then how do we share that knowledge? What we are doing today is one a good example, the Go High monthly webinar. We share knowledge, we share with everybody how we do what we are doing. The world, need, need, the world needs uh, all of us a significant contribution. And also the way to, you know, international Congress, we built various subject matter workshops we do and so on and so forth. In addition to the three core strategic goals, we also make sure to have a strong, robust financial and resource stewardship. So here is a few examples of resource stewardship we do through our Global One Health Partnership. In doing so, as we achieve, build our strategy goals in this, particularly the three core ways in the supportive goals, we build workforce capacity, we strengthen the laboratory, clinical, hospital, and field surveillance capacity, we share that knowledge. If we achieve that, our philosophy is once we do that, that will allow us building capable professionals in the institutional system. So that's all our mission that would lead into a healthy and enduring global community, which is our vision. So the one as leadership in this case, point number one is having this collective vision, clear strategy, knowing what we want to do and knowing what we do not want to do. Articulating that is critical. And I'm very grateful to all the faculty, staff, global partners in shaping our, our strategy in this way. Okay, so to achieve that strategy and goals, you have to bring in multidisciplinary teams. You have to influence, convince, typically siloed disciplines. As we know in university settings, we have colleges, departments, administrative silos. How do you, you don't want to necessarily break the silos or dismantle them, that's not the goal, but how do you work across these existing administrative silos? That's what Global One is about, our office, under the Office of Academic Affairs, International Affairs at the Ohio State University, we work across 13 of the colleges, the various colleges. Health Sciences is obvious one. Lonnie used to be, in fact, my supervisor and great mentor and great colleague, advisor as well, when he was uh, our um, uh, executive dean for health sciences. That's when we launched uh, Go High, really when the stars were aligned between him and myself. So we really brought together the seven health science colleges initially. Later on, we knew that we need business, we need agriculture, we need engineering, we need communications and so on and so forth. So about 13 colleges are, are involved. If I zoom in deeper a little bit, this I'm not going to the details of the disciplines involved, but at least you can see these various colors. Each color represents different colleges, and each of these clusters are one project. These are different projects. This is a pre-COVID data, uh, but you can see that a multidisciplinary team bringing, coming together to work on a defined project goal scope that leads to achieving our mission and our vision. So it's been 
a very rewarding, great, humbling uh, journey for me and all of us at GoHi in terms of bringing these colleges together. We constantly discussed yesterday at our GoHi directors meeting yesterday afternoon, Dr. Berian, Amy Mihalak, Dr. Wang, myself were discussing about how can we optimize, how can we make more impactful contribution bringing these colleges together uh, you know, working under the Global Winners umbrella. That's the bringing talent part. That talent pool also goes into our Ethiopia office. We have a wonderful, incredible multidisciplinary team in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. I was fortunate to visit a couple of weeks ago, as well as a very growing team in Kenya. We have other partners, of course, in many other parts of the world. But one thing we did two weeks ago is talent alignment at our Ethiopia office. We have a great team of food safety zoonosis researchers uh, in terms of omics, the genomics, uh, and other omics, transcriptomics, metabolomics we are envisioning to build capacity on working on uh, antimicrobial resistance, international health regulation, global security, other agenda. And so on. this is a core leadership team, but they will have a very large group of various physicians, veterinarians, public health experts on the ground working across the different uh, projects uh, in Ethiopia. So bringing that talent alignment on the field, bringing the talent alignment at Ohio State, is not is a challenging task, but also a rewarding task because that's one of the critical things you can make really impactful contribution to build a trust, unless you have a clear vision, clear mission, as I tried to articulate today, unless you align your talent pool, both in our case in Columbus, as well as in Ethiopia, unless we work across the system with across partners, federal foundations, some of them Amanda listed earlier, we cannot instill trust to make impactful contribution. We're very fortunate that we have been doing the best we can and I'm very happy and we have a really incredible team of people across uh, our offices that are uh, doing just that and building really instilling trust. So just a few examples of some of the impactful contributions. If you take Ethiopia, just the most recent ones, you know, leading national zero surveillance and knowledge attitude practices surveys in COVID, we completed early on at the onset of the outbreak, the pandemic, public and social measures. These are all one else issues. For us, for Global One Health Initiative, COVID made our work much more impactful and much more uh, accelerated, in fact, because we don't just focus on zoonotic disease or the preventive part, but also the mitigation part. In terms of molecular diagnostics, because we have this aligned, wonderful, well-trusted system on the ground between Ethiopian government. Here is the Minister of Health of Ethiopia, Dr. Leah, with our country director, Dr. Dr. Eba. We were able to build four molecular diagnostic labs. The country had only one of years ago. Now we raised it to five, 400% increase for the nation that can not only diagnose COVID, but also diagnose influenza-like illnesses, other vector-borne viruses, other antimicrobial-resistant bacteria, and so on and so forth. We developed a national roadmap for various zoonotic diseases, 2013 as a model, Lonnie remembers this well, uh, with Revis, we launched that together with CDC, together with Ethiopian government, in fact, picked, chosen by the Ethiopian government as a priority problem to them, but also we evolved through global security into brucellosis and now recently developed guidelines for COVID and so on uh, and so forth. Recently, we rehabilitated nine hospital laboratories. This is a bit outside of the conventional one as definition, but in our global one as de definition, again, that's resource stewardship, as well as really healthy and enduring global communities. During the Northern Ethiopia, some war conflict in the past two years, there were many hospitals were damaged. We rehabilitated nine hospital laboratories. So really, again, building laboratory capacities at the hospital level is part of our, uh, our mission. We move to Kenya, just one slide quickly to show you examples of when you have aligned clear vision, aligned system talent pool. We really grow a wonderful team in Kenya that we have our Global Ones Initiative and the Kenyan partner team are doing incredible job in many ways. For a long time, 
We have been leading a research training program under the NIH Fogarty International Center in various food, water, vector-borne viral and bacterial diseases and AMR as well. We recently, a couple of years ago, launched a food safety project by College of Agriculture leader, for example, Dr. Kowalczyk on food safety funded by USAID. We're working on cholera genome uh, mapping uh, in various slum areas uh, in Kenya. That's led by our Kenya Medical Research Institute, Dr. Sankar Yuki, funded by Wellcome Trust. We have an uh, oncovirus project on cancer, epstein Bar virus that Rob Bayoki from our cancer center uh, leads. We have a vector borne disease project, Abe Satoskar from Department of Pathology that leads together with Kenya Medical Research Institute and International Center for Insect Physiology Ecology. And more recently, it dawned on us that ethics is a very critical part. Of course, we try to fulfill all ethical clearances, but there is no one else ethics. There is a human IRB, there is an animal IACOC. Our wonderful College of Nursing leader, Dr. Donald Omatuna, and uh, veterinary medicine collaborator, Dr. Andrea Ruda, are leading this effort together with the University of Nairobi partners on one else ethics aspects that's funded by NIH uh, as well. So here is, you know, these are various examples. All of these are, you know, the goal is eventually what I showed you, the vision and mission, but these all contribute towards what we do, bringing this multidisciplinary talents from cancer center, pathology, agriculture, nursing, and so on, that traditionally they are siloed but the global one is bringing them uh, together. A couple of slides, of course, you know, not only doing research or training is important, but also how do we share our knowledge? We have global outreach partnership activities constantly happening. Uh, COVID slowed us down a little bit in terms of in-person, but this one was two months before COVID hit that NIH uh, Fogarty Director's Office uh, and our office, Go High, jointly organized a conference to build capacity against what we thought at the time, far future pandemics, which was right at the corner. Uh, or ICOFE Congress that we do every two years in across the world, or monthly webinars like this, we are always open sharing knowledge, which is which we believe is very important to all of us collectively to accelerate our impact. So before I finish, I want to also show you our summer institutes. This is one of the flagship activities that we started back in 2012. Since 2012, we trained close to 6,000 professionals on the ground in many countries. Like this past summer, 2022, we had participants from 43 countries. Thanks to the virtual platform, by the way, we started this 2012 in Eastern Africa, in Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, doing various you know, modular courses over the summer. But now virtually our impacts expanded into global platform. Just this past summer, we had more than 1,800 participants. Over the last 10 years, more than 430 faculty instructors participated. It's not just from Ohio State. I'm very thankful to many of you from global partners, many, Emory University or Cornell or Autonomous University of Mexico, Kenya Medical Research Institute, uh, some others from Ethiopia and many other countries or United Kingdom, uh, many partners. So very grateful to all of you and our impact is growing tremendously and we look forward to for partnership and any of you in this audience would like to be part of it, please let us know. More than 110 courses given and anything you can read here. So we're making impactful contribution, but in my, remember that the one is dimension, what is needed globally is so huge. Our contribution is so minute. We're just starting our action. We look forward for a much more brighter and impactful contributions. So in order to do just that, uh, you would need resources. Uh, sorry, for some reason, the title doesn't show here, but we bring in various resource partners, particularly financial resources. All of these have been wonderful financial contributors, but we've been their partners. We fulfill their strategic mission. They provide us financial resources to make impactful contributions in many countries. Brazilian government, for example, science and technology has been a long standing partner for us in research, in a training, uh, conducting a Congress in Brazil and so on and so forth. So I cannot 
really list everybody, but you can see the logos in some are foundations internationally, uh, impactful foundations like Wellcome Trust, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Some are federal government, NSF, NIH, USAID, others, or some are in-country partners, University of Gondor or Kenya Medical Research Institute, and so on and so forth. But again, the other point uh, I mentioned earlier is you know, mobilizing resources effectively. We're doing the best we can, but the resources needed still in need to really have impactful oneness contribution is much larger than what we know. So to summarize, uh, just one is leadership, you know, many wonderful points Lani made, but we need to work in enhanced synergistic opportunities really in an efficient way. I believe the second point in a win-win, mutually beneficial, equal and trusted partnership is needed. We, many of us in the US or in Europe, should have that mindset that there are wonderful talents provided the money, the resource available. There are many, many smart people, be it in Ethiopia, Kenya, or others. How can we listen to them, work with them, also work with their priorities, okay? So we need to have that genuine capacity building, robust resource mobilization, and really integrated solution to make impactful uh, contributions. One quote I have is Dr. Kevin Marsh. I remember back in Arusha, I think about 10 years ago, he mentioned, don't be someone's field site. Yes, I repeat it here again to all my, my colleagues uh, uh, from, let's say, Sub-Saharan Africa, Kenya, Ethiopia, others, or Asia. We scientists in the US, as well as Europe, have to bear in mind, it's not like I have a field site. I reviewed many grants in NIH that says, blah, blah, Arizona, blah, blah, doctor has a field site in Malawi. Don't be somebody's field site. You have a partner, you need to develop equal trusted partner with a genuine capacity building. There are many smart people. Unfortunately, we need, we kind of have more of the larger in terms of financial resources, but that doesn't give us the uh, utmost authority to make impact. I think listening, building trust to each other in equal footing, equal partnership is crucial to make a sustainable and impactful contribution. So with that, I will finish. So thank you so much. I really appreciate this invite. Thank you so much, Dr. Cabreas and Dr. King for that masterclass in One Health Leadership. I think that was, you touched on a lot of wonderful points and I think we'll explore some of those more now in our discussion with our audience members. And so just a reminder, if you did want to pose a question to one of our panelists today, please use the Q&A box. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started with one of the questions that we received through that um, Q&A. So the first uh, comment and question we got was first of all, thanking our presentation, um, our presenters for the wonderful presentation, very enlightening. Um, the question was that, um, Dr. King, you mentioned that the world is not well prepared for the next pandemic. And so the, the thought being that has a lot to do with leadership. And so the question being, what do you think the scientific community can do to be more proactively engaged um, with leadership across the globe? Uh, thanks, Amanda. That's a, a terrific question and um, probably requires another lecture uh, conversation, but um, um, we aren't well prepared. Uh, and I think that's very true. And I think as a scientific community, we need to get more engaged with policymakers, uh, with finance ministers, and with people outside of our community that we're most comfortable with. So if leadership is about influencing, we're talking about being influential in a positive way of people who are making decisions, people who are giving resources, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, what I have, and maybe uh, Laura or, or Amanda, so, so uh, we just did a publication and this publication comes from the Council on um, Agriculture, Science, and Technology. It's, it's called Zoonotic Diseases in Animal Agriculture and Beyond, a One Health Perspective. And it gives five recommendations. Uh, and um, Laura, perhaps you could give the link to this. Uh, people can download it free. Uh, and it's www.cast, C-A-S-T, um, slash, um, science.org 
Um, so Laura, maybe you can put that on the uh, post-it so people can see it. So you can download that. So we talk about the five things that are, I think, critical in trying to answer this question. Uh, one is what we already alluded to is changing the narrative. The idea that is that we need to, to justify and legitimize this cause. And we can't do it just talking to ourselves. Uh, in order to do this, uh, you know, that narrative changes into national security, into uh, cost effectiveness financially and, you know, across, uh, across countries as, as we move ahead. So it, 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 it's not just about kind of uh, focusing on, on the science of infectious disease. It's really focusing on, uh, you know, the impact. And the idea, if we prevent uh, and catch these diseases up front, we will um, automatically impact, I think, uh, the security of a country, and we need to be better prepared. The second one is, uh, is, is instituting a One Health surveillance system. We're talking about One Health, not just a human health surveillance system. It's understanding um, this collage of domains. And the situation analysis is going to be based on our surveillance and putting that together into a key strategy, not single strategies that are isolated by themselves. And then it's this idea of spanning boundaries. Um, so we, we need to be influential and talk outside the scientific community. Uh, and that's so important, you know, I think in global health. We have a new advantage. We now have G7, G20, United Nations probably all national antimicrobial resistant uh, action plans, all have designated One Health as the key strategy. So we are now have gained the attention of uh, influential organizations that we not had before. So when you're talking to people within country, you can talk about, well, this is what the G20 or the G7 or um, World Health or World Animal Health Organization (FAO) and uh, uh, WHO have gone together into a new strategy. So you know, talk you know, talking about that as we move forward is really important. I just attended two weeks ago a G7 conference in Canada, specifically uh, uh, focused on One Health. So the first time ever that these seven countries, influential with lots of resources, are now looking at networking together and putting together a new strategy to move ahead. So we have that new advantage coming forward. So we need to kind of ride the coattails uh, on that. The fourth one is, is rebuilding our infrastructures. And, and Dr. Gabreas did a great job and is doing a great job of talking about building capacity. So I think that capacity is not just based on moving from one outbreak or one pandemic to another. It is putting together a permanent, scientifically adroit uh, a team in every country. Not wait for an outbreak and people to come marching in with certain resources and then leaving when it's all over. But this is really changing your infrastructure and your capability on detecting um, and, uh, and actions that move ahead, really absolutely critical. Uh, and then the last one I think is forming communities of solution, not just being members of another committee to talk about this. This is about solutions. So one of the things that we recommended in this report that we just put out on, uh, on CAST is changing the whole concept of community health. Well, if, you know, health is based on more than just infectious diseases, then that community health needs to talk and, and look at a bigger group of people. Uh, and that can be done in any world, any country of, of the world today. So agriculture, one health, plants and, and, and animal health become part of that global health strategy. You know, I think as, uh, as we move ahead, I think go high, right? Is actually a community of solutions. We are building capacity, we're learning from each other, uh, and we're being better prepared because of this community, I think, to move ahead. And I think that's really positive. So a lot of uh, One Health networks, I think. Uh, so that's, I'm sorry, I'm in a, a kind of a long answer, but it's those five strategies that are really important and, and, um, and understanding how to be adaptive. Uh, these aren't technical answers. 
Uh, these aren't about medical answers. These are about social answers to difficult problems. Thanks. Yeah. Excellent and well articulated. Dr. Gabreas, did you have more to add to that question? I think Lonnie answered it sufficiently. So let's move on, assuming we have more questions. <laughs> we, we do have more questions. And, and maybe this is a good um, segue. You talked about these you know, different committees. And, and the question that here refers to um, how is it possible to implement one health leadership? And is it possible to pull and lead as one of the four major heads, human, animal, plant, and environmental health under one leader? Because the, the um, participant comments that commonly one health is implemented in the form of collective committees, which are can be less powerful in enforcing country decision makers. So we'd love to hear your comments on that question. Excellent question. Uh, so when you are a leader, we have to remember that it's not about the technically being capable of doing everything, right? Not a single person cannot be a physician, a veterinarian, that's not about it. Uh, leadership recently I was referring as more of like a choreography. You are facilitating, right? So uh, yes, it's uh, in, in a formal way, any organization needs one leader. Uh, but at the same time, that leader can come from one of those disciplines or maybe even outside of those disciplines, by the way. But yes, one leader is possible and should be in a formal sense. But actually, leadership happens, you know, bottom up, right? So uh, the role of that formal leader is really choreographing or facilitating and empowering, bringing talents together and making that. So the examples I give, for example, I mean, none of those, almost none, but not everything, but uh, really I give my credit, uh, credit to myself, right? So the technical uh, leaders, the PIs on cancer or the food safety or others have many incredible, you know, discipline specific uh, talents, but one has leadership bringing those two together to weave in into impactful uh, contribution. So. The answer is yes, and it has to be that way, but but you have to think, the person asking this question, you have to think about leadership is not about that, your technical capability, but your ability to influence others towards a common goal. Again, uh, uh, phrasing what Lonnie defined earlier. So very good question. So minute 1, one thing I might add is, you know, uh, you know, we, we think of government agencies um, so often in terms of putting together strategies. And, and I think we also need to think of pu public-private partnerships. There are, are several, between two and 3,000 uh, NGOs worldwide. Think about that. And the one thing they lack is kind of situation awareness and the ability to have leaders in their organizations. So we have tremendous opportunities outside of our own communities that we, that, that we talk to. Uh, and then I think it's the idea of leading up that comes out of this meta uh, leadership model. The ability then as a team of leaders then to be influential in ministers of finance, of, of health, of other strategies to move forward. I, I, I think things would be better if we had a single kind of one health leaders in countries um, but, you know, that's probably not going to happen. I, th I think that uh, actions take place, get, will take place through teams, uh, but resources will be gained by leadership. So um, we need to have people that have influence beyond, I think, our biomedical communities. And then the last point is we need to point out to everybody why a One Health strategies or group of strategies is more cost effective than the status quo. If you can do that to a, a minister of finance or to a Gates Foundation or to a private industry that wants to help, they listen because that means their resources are being spent in a better way. So if you think about you, you know, uh, putting things in terms of why this strategy is more cost effective than the status quo, then I think you gain a lot more influence. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks to you both for your inputs on that question. Um, this next question, it seems to be uh, geared towards Dr. Gabreas, is do you think intersectoral collaboration in terms of information sharing and resources is encouraging and one health works in Africa, particularly in Ethiopia? Yeah, so of course, in the information sharing that intersectoral partnership 
not only it helps, uh, I would say this is required. It's necessary to address one of the issues. Uh, you have to remember that one of the issues address that interface of you know, human animal plant environment, right? That interface. So interoperable data sharing, information sharing would be so crucial. Uh, for instance, if you take, I think some of us in, in the US has received maybe questions from uh, our physician scientists who deal with, you know, having somebody who travel to tropical region and has parasitic disease or GI tract problem that the physician is not familiar with. Uh, you know, many of our physician scientists are not necessarily trained very well in zoonotic diseases. If, if we train veterinarians just in veterinary medicine and physicians just in human disease, what happens to those at the interface? That interface is a critical part of one health, right? So be it a food safety issue, waterborne diseases, vector-borne diseases, or environmental, be a chemical hazard related to non-communicable diseases. I think that intersectorality information sharing is, is necessary and required. It's not unique to Africa or Ethiopia, uh, but it's very important. What happens, my observation in Ethiopia, as well as uh, some developing regions is because of resource scarcity and that scarce mentality, people tend to hold on data, hold on information and look for resources for their own organization rather than working in abundance mentality. That is really counterproductive uh, nor it, it defeats the purpose of One Health. Uh, so uh, I would say absolutely. So you, information sharing is necessary and you have to work with abundance mentality, but to really address these complex, wicked problems in One Health, I would say it's, it's required to share information if we want to prevent outbreaks or mitigate outbreaks effectively. Short answer. Great, thank you. And I, I want to maybe jump to this question. And if you have anything else to add, um, either Dr. Conductor Gabreas about this question referring to um, how to create strong One Health teams, potentially in countries where the concept is not yet uh, fully accepted. And the, the participant gives an example of um, Somalia. If you have any additional comments for that participant. Okay, I can jump in and learn it. So I think we all lived through this, the one else concept, uh, you know, in a practical way, many of us in developing countries, myself being in Sub-Saharan Africa, without calling it one else, we did one else a long time ago. I was a veterinarian, a practitioner in Borana, pastoral region, south part of Ethiopia, and we've been dealing with issues between camels, cows, the livelihood of communities, uh, and you know, healthcare service delivery. My eyes, a veterinarian, the physician, together delivering healthcare to the pastoralists, to families, and and animals. Regardless of whether we call it one else uh, or not, but in the scales now we have really one as a very good umbrella terminology. Uh, I think what you need to do is you have to demonstrate practically. Earlier, in fact, Lonnie mentioned clearly that. You know, how do you differentiate from the status quo, from the typical veterinary medicine or the typical uh, human health and show value to your stakeholders, to your communities, to your leaders that working in the one health dimension, number one, it is necessary to address these complex issues, drug resistance, to microbial resistance or, or you know, parasitic or viral zoonosis and others. Uh, but number two, it's also resource efficient way in so many ways. Healthcare service delivery is one example, but also in a very resource efficient way. You can demonstrate it practically. It will take time for us, you know, 15 years ago, if you think of Ohio State, prior to Dr. King's arrival, in fact, we invited him from CDC to give a talk, I remember, and he talked about One Health. At that same time, I said, okay, this is one else, but I have done one health 20 years ago in Ethiopia. We even called it one health, right? So uh, you have to be able to demonstrate it in a very granular, practical way and show it as value to your communities and to your ministries of health and others, as well as in academia. Um, I found it much more challenging to instill one else at Ohio State definitely less easier in Brazil, Northeast Brazil or Ethiopia. People get it very qu quickly. 
you know, by the time we started Wanels in Ethiopia, there were 52,000 cows in Addis Ababa, in the capital city, dairy cows. Everybody has dogs and as, you know, you don't have much of alarm system, maybe now, but at that time, you know, guarding your, uh, your properties or our donkeys carrying, um, you know, uh, materials from home to markets and so on and so forth. It's easier to convince about one in developing region, I found, I found it, at least my own experience, than to my own colleagues at Ohio State, which took much more number of years to convince many of our um, community members. Thanks. Okay. Great, thank you for those insights. Dr. King, do you have anything else to add to that question in particular? No, I think Wanderson did a, a, a great job. The other thing to emphasize is leadership doesn't mean that you're head of a big organization. Leadership can be done locally on the ground uh, in you know, small ways that, that day after day really make a difference. Whether in Somalia where you know, we worry about, you know, is there a is there a public will to do this? And you know, how much unrest is really kind of overwhelming what we need to do day to day. So these, so what, what would seem like small kinds of actions day in and day out can really make a positive change. So leaders can be really effective, I think, at that level as we, as we move forward. Excellent. Thank you so much. And just uh, acknowledge a big thank you to our participants, too, for your questions. Apologies if we don't get to each one of your questions. Um, with our remaining time, I just wanted to pose the question to both of you. Uh, I imagine many of the participants on the webinar today who might be listening at a different uh, time are wanting to build competency, are wanting to, to, like you said, Dr. King, match their skills and competencies with opportunities. I'm surely you all have taken and participated in different leadership trainings. What do you think are the components? What should participants be looking for if they're looking to build that skill and competency and leadership? Um, what should they be looking for in, in, a, in a leadership training that would be um, helpful in building those competencies? Well, let me just add quickly, and then Wanderson can 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 add to that. I, I've never seen more opportunities than I than exist today on leadership development and training. Uh, they're everywhere, whether you're at the university or a, a, a health agency or uh, just the ability to sign up online in terms of networks. So the opportunities are there. I, I think it's making the personal commitment to say this is going to be important to me. It's going to be important to how I contribute into the future. And my life and my fulfillment will actually be enhanced if I do this better. So this means I need to acquire this skill set. And if I do, I think I can add a lot more. So it is this self-awareness, I think, Amanda, that's so important. You need to do a critical assessment of where you are and then understand, well, what is it that we need to add? And we just listed those competencies. You can do those with um, online training. You can do those with One Health Networks that are building capacity. Uh, these are, are free, right, if you will. And then just be able to, to join your local communities, to volunteer, to, you know, engage. Uh, and really important then to have a mentor or a coach that will help guide you, that will help give you input, I think, as you, as you move forward. Uh, and then it's practice. Uh, no, leaders always start the same place the same way, but they develop over a lifetime. So make that commitment now. And the idea is that you will get better kind of, you know, as you go um, with building those. So you can sign up for 10 different leadership training opportunities now, but practice, practice, practice. Fantastic. Thank you. Dr. Gabreas? Just a quick addition. So um, uh, definitely there are, you know, as Ronnie wonderfully said, there are a number of leadership training opportunities, but, you know, focusing on what are really the critical leadership skills that are necessary to really impact uh, one health. Uh, you know, you can emphasize in your training on those aspects, you know, adding those values that things that you value and really practicing them is good. Just to mention a few, one, 
no one mentioned it, but he and I discussed 10 or more years ago, and we did even workshop on that is meta leadership, for example. How do you work across knowing how to effectively work across administrative barriers as well as discipline barriers is, I think, critical a skill. How can you effectively work on those? And we've done this in Arusha, Tanzania. We've done it in Ethiopia as well. You know, uh, looking at, you know, how do you bring in, you know, you, you are a veterinarian, as another physician, as a social science, others, how do you work across those boundaries? But more importantly, also between your Ministry of Public Health, Ministry of Agriculture and Environment, others. So I think that's critical. So you, then you sharpen your skills through practice, sharpening those skills through practice. For all of us across the world, uh, one of the key skills and that we need to know really to be effective in one of I believe is empathy. We really have to listen carefully what's the needs of others. We constantly face it. Recently, we said it in Kenya on during around, around the table that you know, partners should not just impose you know, actions or activities on you on, in Kenya or in Ethiopia. You have to, you know, whoever wants to partner with you, be it from England or UK or US or, or others really having that empathy. So all of us in one else have to have that deep empathy to listen to each other's problems, to then commit to service. You know, that, that's more of a commitment, you know, to serve others. I think things like that, there are defined skills that I believe are subsets of the broader leadership that are crucial for effective one's implementation. So those are just a few examples. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. And we are at time. So I want to thank again our participants, those who um, tuned in today, provided your questions and uh, were able to um, contribute to this great discussion. And of course, to our two presenters today, Dr. King, Dr. Gabreas, thank you so much for providing your wisdom on this topic and sharing with us your expertise that you've um, get garnered from your extensive experience and sharing that with us today. So a big thank you to you all. Um, Dr. Binkley, do you have final remarks? Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank again, Drs. King and Gabreas for your highly impactful presentations. It's truly a pleasure and an honor to be able to work with such outstanding leaders. I'd also like to thank you, Dr. Amer Amanda Berrien, our uh, GOHI Director of Outreach and Engagement, as well as an Assistant Professor and Associate Director of the Veterinary Public Health Program here at Ohio State University for your wonderful moderation. Um, and then I'd like to invite you to please join us to kick off our 2023 webinar series on January 19th, when we'll be hearing from Jason Servanek for, of the Ohio State University Bird Polar and Climate Research Center presenting on climate change in One Health. And thank you for your wonderful questions and participation. We look forward to seeing you in the new year. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.